Hello, everyone. Welcome to this AbleNet, AbleNet's webinar. And the title today is Enhancing Teaching and Learning with UDL, Universal Design for Learning, and Multiple Formats for Access and Engagement, Learner Engagement. That's the topic today. And what are we going to be focusing on? Universal Design for Learning, the acronym is UDL. And these principles really are drawn from the original principles that were used in architecture to design buildings that provide kind of maximal access to people with different types of needs. And as part of today's webinar, I'm going to focus on the instructional delivery process and how we can make this process, this delivery process, so that students with disabilities can maximally access it and we can reduce the barriers to the students. There are three principles, and I'm going to focus on two of those learning principles today. And I'm going to share with you a number of examples of how do you apply universal design for learning in the classroom when you are working with students with uh, disabilities. And we will also look at a couple of scenarios uh, and how can we enable these students to reach uh, academic and functional outcomes uh, enabled by universal design for learning. And universal design for learning is really applied at the design phase of instruction. And uh, personally, I am an author of a number of books, and many of those are listed there. And some of my books include uh, books on significant disabilities, severe and, severe and multiple disabilities, and autism. And I'm excited to say my most recent book, the newest book, is now available from LRP Publications. And the title of the book is Students with Significant Disabilities at the Crossroads of IDEA and ESA, the new law that was passed. And you can see that on the slide, the books and products, and, um, and I have several books that I have published. Let me begin with a question and kind of to kind of for us to imagine what UDL should be, should be and how it is not limited to one thing, but a variety and a diverse group of students, how can they access learning? So the question is, a teacher delivers a lesson on the topic of biomes, that is the ecosystems. And this one is an example that I actually saw in a classroom. And she was using smart board technology. She, or let's say he, if the teacher were a male, is implementing universal design for learning, the principles, and is applying that by providing access to all the learners using the smart board technology. Are we addressing diverse and complex learning needs just by presenting it or through presenting it in a, using smart board technology? So that's the question. So the teacher is implementing UDL principles and is definitely incorporating UDL principles in the classroom for students with diverse and complex learning needs. So your response is requested. Is that yes or no? Please let us know. I am just thrilled that you all understand that universal design for learning is not just the use of smart board technology. It includes a variety of ways information is accessed by learners. And so let's look at this instructional framework. So as we are designing our instructional framework, to address the needs of students with cognitive, communication, behavioral, and motor needs so that they can attain uh, academic and functional outcomes. One of the things at the design phase 
is the application of UDL principles. As a matter of fact, in my newest book, every lesson framework incorporates, as part of the routine instructional process, application of UDL principles and examples of how to do it. In addition to the UDL principle, one of the things that you have to be thinking about in terms of your, uh, your lesson framework, instructional framework, how do we make sure that delivery is engaging, which actually connects with the, one of the three principles of UDL. And you want to have active engagement so that the student's motivation is sustained. And uh, then it will also lead to the success with the uh, academic and the functional outcomes. And then the next thing that you want to make sure that are we providing optimal challenge to the students. For this, in order to provide that, you may have to make flexible uh, uh, the, the uh, methods that you provide should provide some kind of flexibility of approach adjustment in task challenges, and you have to have technology supports so that you are making sure it is student-specific, the learner-specific, and you are providing both mainstream and assistive technology uh, aids. And the other important thing in the instructional framework as you are uh, looking at your classroom of students with diverse and complex needs is are some students not able to access it at the level in which they, it is being presented? So is there a way they can maybe partially participate if they are not able to fully participate in an activity? So that is another factor that we have to consider as part of this instructional framework, and UDL is a major part of that. Uh, so, in order to get a kind of a grasp of what UDL is, by the people who designed it, CAST. Uh, so, I thought it may be helpful to take a look at this video. And um, and I, uh, it's coming. I'm just being a little impatient, and um, the, uh, the, this, this video teacher is needs to meet a curriculum and a goal, and she's got a very diverse group minutes. of students. And so does this teacher. And this one. Most do. In fact, research shows that the way people learn is as unique as their fingerprints. What does this mean for teachers of today? Classrooms are highly diverse and curriculum needs to be designed from the start to meet this diversity. Universal Design for Learning is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. Whoa, that's a fancy term. Universal Design for Learning. Let's unpack it a bit. Let's think about the word universal. By universal, we mean curriculum that can be used and understood by everyone. Each learner in the classroom brings her own background, strengths, needs, and interests. Curriculum should provide genuine learning opportunities for each and every student. Now let's think about the word learning. Learning is not one thing. Neuroscience tells us that our brains have three broad networks. One for recognition, the what of learning. One for skills and strategies, the how of learning. And one for caring and prioritizing, the why of learning. Students need to gain knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm for learning. And a curriculum needs to help them do all three. But every learner is unique, and one size does not fit all. So how do we make a curriculum that challenges and engages diverse learners? This is where the word design comes in. A universally designed building is planned to be flexible and to accommodate all kinds of users, with and without disabilities. It turns out that if you design for those in the margins, your building works better for everyone. Curb cuts and ramps are used by people in wheelchairs, people with strollers, and people on bikes. Captioning on TV serves people who are deaf, people learning English, people in gyms, and spouses who get to sleep at different times. 
UDL takes this idea and applies it to the design of flexible curriculum. UDL goes beyond access because we need to build in support and challenge. So how do we use the UDL framework to make learning goals, methods, materials, and assessments that work for everyone? First, ask yourself, what is my goal? What do I want my students to know, do, and care about? Then ask, what barriers in the classroom might interfere with my diverse students reaching these goals? To eliminate the barriers, use the three UDL principles to create flexible paths to learning so that each student can progress. Number one, provide multiple means of representation. Present content and information in multiple media and provide varied supports. Use graphics and animation, highlight the critical features, activate background knowledge, and support vocabulary so that students can acquire the knowledge being taught. Number two, provide multiple means of action and expression. Give students plenty of options for expressing what they know and provide models, feedback, and supports for their different levels of proficiency. Number three, provide multiple means of engagement. What fires up one student won't fire up another. Give students choices to fuel their interests and autonomy. Help them risk mistakes and learn from them. If they love learning, they will persist through challenges. And remember, always keep in mind the learning goal. Get rid of barriers caused by the curriculum and keep the challenge where it belongs. And that's it. Okay, quick recap. Show the information in different ways. Allow your students to approach learning tasks and demonstrate what they know in different ways. And offer options that engage students and keep their interest. Universal design for learning equals learning opportunities for all. For more information. Okay, so you got an idea of basic information about universal design for learning. It has, as uh, was pointed out, it has three major principles, multiple means of presenting information to the students. Because we do have often diverse learners with different learning styles and different ways of approaching learning. And uh, today we will be focusing on principle one and principle three, because I personally feel the multiple ways to present information and multiple means of uh, engaging the student go together. So I'm going to focus on that and I will show you a variety of models and examples that you can use in order to apply that. And in the next UDL webinar, I will focus much more on the way multiple means of action and expression, response modes for students so that they can demonstrate what they have learned and we, the adult, the teacher, the support staff and others can provide the necessary feedback to the student. So UDL offers built-in access for a wide range of users. So what is multiple means of representation? So can we provide different options for perception? Can we customize the display of information so that it, it, is, it provides a visual, it provides the auditory, it provides the tactile, depending on the need of the student? Can we provide a variety of options for students who may be speaking other languages or who may have significant communication needs, those who may need symbols? Can we use objects like calculators and tools, like measure, measurement tools? Uh, so we have to look at how can we provide options for symbols and languages? And, and then another important thing in multiple format is how can we provide options for comprehension? And one of the most important things in terms of compre comprehension, we have to make sure we activate that prior knowledge. Connect it with something the student has already learned, something that student can recognize, the st something that student can connect with. So that is very important. And then at the same time, it is important also to make that connection with something that is kind of personally relevant and meaningful for that student. So that it's, you know, it connects with some interesting person or an interesting object or interesting kind of place. 
So that is kind of connecting it so that it improves students' comprehension, but at the same time, it also will engage the student much better. How can we provide uh, uh, kind of supports like we highlight the critical future features? How do we provide uh, present big ideas in a story or a text passage and connect it with the uh, learners' understanding and comprehension? And how do we pro provide relationships between different concepts and ideas? Uh, how do we guide the student to process that information that was presented? And just as important is how do we make sure that the activity that we are presenting to the student, that delivery that we are making uh, to present the information, enable the student to transfer it from short-term memory to long-term memory through the use of hands-on activity so that it becomes part of the prior knowledge and in the future they will be able to recall it. So, and in addition to that, UDL also means or uh, kind of make sure that we are thinking in terms of the environmental arrangement and the adaptations that we provide uh, uh, before we begin that instructional delivery. So in a, in a, in a way, it is the design phase. How do we customize it? What kind of adaptations do we need? Do we need to make physical environment? For a student who gets easily distracted, can we make sure that the student is next to us, another student who does not get distracted, who is much more attentive, is also closer to the, the adult present or the teacher, uh, so that uh, there is nothing, no barrier between the teacher and the student, and he can make immediate eye contact and immediate connection with the smart board or immediate connection with the uh, bulletin board, whatever you are using as the instructional medium at that time. And uh, are we providing that student with some kind of a scheduling if the student needs the transition from one activity to the other world? So the seating arrangement, the visual display of uh, academic and instructional information, or are we connecting and pointing out items on a vocabulary board or a word wall so that the student can connect, to, connect with it? Let's say, let's go back to that example I mentioned about the ecosystem and the biomes. Can we show some pictures that, so that the student can immediately connect with that? Uh, so that is a visual display. Uh, uh, is the student having easy access to the different instructional centers? And that becomes particularly important, especially at the early childhood uh, level. And what, ahead of time, can we think of all the barriers and try to remove as many of these barriers as possible so that the student can access that information? That is kind of basically uh, uh, the UDL in terms of presentation or representation of information or the concept. And how do we personalize it to serve all learners? As I said, prior planning, prior, sorry, prior planning. And we make sure all the steps to an activity are, are clear. Some students may understand it immediately when you give verbal directions, but others may need to see it visually. Others may need it broken down into simpler, much less complex steps. A set of steps, and can we model the activities? Can we provide guided practice? And one of the most important things in terms of understanding a new concept, new information, we have to make sure the student is given sufficient processing time. And can we make sure there are groups and group projects, and we pair students together so that, or group them together so that they can help each other, and students get peer support in order to complete it. So here is a survey that I would like to kind of use and find out what methods of les lesson delivery that you you know, the people who are participating in today's webinar used to provide access to learners with diverse and complex needs. Um, if you can identify the method you use the most, uh, then you will be completing the survey. Do you use multimedia presentations with interactive tools? 
a lot or do you use text paired with representational items? What I mean is concrete items or sometimes you may use pictures. Um, do you use a lot of hands-on activities and paired with real measurement tools or concrete items, something to represent numbers or do you use heavily simplified text passages so that the student uh, can maintain his attention and does not uh, uh, kind of turn off from the lesson. So go ahead and indicate the method that you use most. Is it multimedia? Is it text with visuals? Is it hands-on activities with real items? Or is it simplified and adapted summary? Okay, thank you very much. It looks like uh, hands-on activities with real concrete items. Great, fantastic. That is one way to reach students with significant needs because when they touch the item or they uh, work with the item that's real and concrete related to the concept we are presenting, it immediately connects and makes a connection and it helps with their long-term memory. And it is wonderful that you are using technology too. There's 25% of the people use multimedia with interactive tools. That's great. And um, one of the things that I will focus on also is some of the other items that are that are also helpful, and that is how do we make sure that we provide adapted summary so that a student who has limited attention span and is not able to, let's say, go through a whole book of Charlotte's Web, we also provide adapted summary so that they get the concept about what's going on, the theme of the story, and the important conflict and problems and the uh, uh, corresponding uh, sequence of events so that it, it kind of connects with the learner much more quickly. So the other aspect of universal design for learning, we looked at multiple ways to present information. I will show you actual examples in just a few minutes, but we are also going to be looking at because engagement is very much connected with how we present information. When we want students to be motivated, when we want students to sustain their attention, which helps their short-term and processing it into their long-term memory. We want students to be engaged. And there are ways students show their engagement and we kind of get their engagement. Uh, one of the ways is when the student has choices, it kind of provides the student an opportunity for kind of expressing his or her autonomy. So I am in control, and that kind of increases their joy with the activity. It increases kind of their pleasure level, the dopamine level, and it increases their engagement. And the other thing that goes with that, can we make sure we remove or the distractions that may be present? As I gave an earlier an example that seat the student close to the teacher, seat the student to where the information is being presented, seat the student close to somebody who is usually showing very high levels of engagement. Um, and the next one is can we provide different options for sustaining effort and persisting in the task? Uh, so. If we often, often we find that when you give some students, particularly students who have difficulty uh, spending a lot of time on a math sheet or in a writing activity, if we give them, let's say, a page with 30 multiplication problems or uh, 30 addition problems, they may get sometimes overwhelmed by looking at that paper and may act out. So is there a way we can adjust the task complexity level or the task demand level so that, you know, reduce the number of problems or do every uh, odd one, odd problem or even one problem or make the writing essay uh, a much shorter one or provide some kind of a framework for that? Uh, 
And in addition to that, we also want to provide options for self-regulation. It's kind of connected with sustaining effort and persistence because they need to be motivated. They need to kind of focus attention. They need to be able to filter out distraction. And for that, they need to develop some coping skills and self-control and impulse control. So that is also part of uh, increasing that student engagement. And we have to make sure we have uh, uh, encouraging feedback and a variety of things. And I will talk about a lot, uh, some of this in my next webinar when we talk about action and expression. And uh, moving on to the next slide, how do we facilitate active learner engagement in multiple ways? As you all, many of you pointed out, you, many of you use hands-on activities so that they, it facilitates immediate practice and helps with memory transfer. And uh, one of the things that you want to look at, are we uh, using novelty? Novelty is another way, and this is supported by brain research, that sustains attention and increases motivation. Are you using as much as possible a multi sensory approach, not just the visual, not just the auditory, but also uh, concrete items, manipulatives, and you know, talking calculators, and representational items. And then are you using for when they are doing some writing, can you, are you using like filled out templates so that a uh, couple of sentences are already done and then they can add one or two additional sentences? Uh, are you providing opportunities for them to be part of a group, and most importantly, are you providing choices so that it increases their feeling of autonomy? And one of the important things, as I mentioned right at the very beginning, but partial participation is also important to think of right at the design phase of your instruction. What is partial participation? If a student is not able to completely independently do a task, is there some way can we provide uh, the student some support and maybe do one or two steps in a task instead of having to do it everything uh, completely? Like, for example, some of the examples that I have given, uh, finding a location for a group activity, even if the student is not able to uh, go by himself, can he use some kind of a picture card that shows the group and his chair? And can we put, for example, uh, his photo in that group so that he makes his way? So that's kind of both adaptation and partially participation. While other students may actually go to the group without having anybody tell them uh, and join the reading activity. Can we make sure that we provide some kind of an adapted version of a book if the student is not able to read the book independently? Can we use like a bookworm and provide that so that the student is able to follow that? Let's say in a student who has got motor needs, if the student is not able to help himself and feed himself, is there a way can the student at least lift the spoon up to his mouth, so partially participation, partially participate in the act of um, eating. Can the student touch the objects on a book when in uh, partially participating in the reading of the book? So let's look at a scenario, uh, Jordan. Jordan has a diagnosis of autism, spect autism spectrum disorders. He's capable of good verbal skills but he tends to use mostly single words or phrases to communicate. And he doesn't initiate much communication with his peers. And he does exhibit tantrum behaviors when he is asked to stop a preferred activity or change to a new activity. I am not going to go into too many behavior strategies here. I am going to focus mainly on the instructional supports that we can provide uh, to enable him in terms of UDL access and engagement. So what are some tools and techniques that will help Jordan? One of the things that I am listing, that is an adapted summary. Because Jordan 
loses interest quickly. He is not able to focus attention with a very large, uh, like a chapter book or something like that. If we can make, in addition to that, an adapted summary in order to increase his comprehension, he is more likely to pay attention. Then can we use like concept, ma concept maps and Venn diagrams to facilitate his comprehension of that story itself. Can we provide a writing template uh, to write stories? If he's writing a story, a couple of sentences or three sentences are provided, and he completes the other two sentences. The other way is using frame sentences where one or two words are left out, and uh, Jordan gets, let's say, a word bank, and he picks words from there to complete it because Jordan finds it very difficult to do any writing activity. Another way is drama and role play. Jordan may not respond to it immediately, but when you use it as part of a group activity to, let's say, the story of Charlotte's Web or Wizard of Oz or Gulliver's Travel, and you use a little bit of it, a little bit of the story to use for role, role play and drama, and then that will also help Jordan to better comprehend, better access the concepts, the ideas presented in that. And then can Jordan be part of a collaborative project, a group project, so that it provides him an opportunity for social interaction and he will be forced to initiate communication as part of the group project. He has to communicate with his peers. And then, of course, we do have to provide ongoing behavior supports to reduce one of the barriers, which is his behavior issues. So this is an example of a more, somewhat more complex graphic organizer. I will show, show you in a little bit a less complex graphic organizer. So let's say he is looking at, let's say, the Wizard of Oz or or the Giving Tree, or Charlotte's Web. So these are some of the events he identifies. This is another way that he can use this to help with his writing also. He identifies the characters and he identifies the problem. This, as a matter of fact, will help not only with, with his engagement, but also will help later on when we talk about action and expression, how he responds, his response mode, and how can we connect it with either uh, visuals and visuals paired with text and all that. The another example, this is let's say it is at the high school level and they are looking at different time periods and making comparisons. How can the student generate information and we are pairing visuals with text and the student uses this to make his uh, engagement you know, a way, a make his, you know, to enable his access and engagement. And to, uh, another example is a simulated store, and it could be a collaborative project that the students put together, and uh, they, they can set up the mm, simulated store, and this will enable them to role play, communicate, and collaborate with each other, and at the same time, learn problem solving skills, and of course, the basic money skills through this, and uh, this will also provide additional opportunities for both access and engagement. And then this would be a choice-making chart when given three responses, three choices, and the student, like Jordan, makes a choice. You can have a two-column T-chart, or you can have a three-column T-chart. Um, let's say the student is identifying the differences between a reptile uh, and a mammal. Well, you know, there are three choices. One, that doesn't even connect with the uh, concept. And two, that are one correct answer. One, somewhat related, but, n but an incorrect response. So this is another way for the student. And building science knowledge, how can, this, how can we present information to the student that engages the student? So the student is given, again, somewhat like a concept map, and the student identifies one other carnivore, one other omnivore, one other herbivore, and the pictures that are given provide as the motivation to engage the student in that activity. 
And another way to use graphic tools is Venn diagram, making similarities, identifying similarities and differences, let's say between a vertebrae and an invertebrae, so science concept, and we are presenting the science concept, and you can use it as part of your smart board, you can use it part of your PowerPoint presentation, or on just on a whiteboard, and the student see it, and they, the student can also have another one, a so, smaller model at his desk where he is uh, using visuals to identify similarities and differences using a Venn diagram. And we are now moving on to a different learner with somewhat more significant needs. Simone has cerebral palsy and she has motor needs. Her communication and motor difficulties present challenges for her in her active participation during academic instruction. Due to her motor difficulties, she uses a wheelchair and she is not able to use uh, independently uh, a crayon or a pencil. And she's very friendly by nature. She smiles a lot and she is very eager to communicate with peers and she uses a few gestures, but does not use words to communicate. So what are some tools can we use in order to provide that UDL-based approach to increase her access and increase her engagement? Concrete materials, limited text presented at a given time, an adapted book fastened with actually real objects or visuals, so the objects and the visuals are actually attached to the book with Velcro, and she looks at them, touches them, eye gazes them to increase her motivation, and lots and lots of, when I say hands-on activity, in her case, she will use an adapted brush and use that brush uh, inserted into her closed fist and touch it, touch the object with that. Um, she uses choice board and she can use the choice board using uh, eye gaze and uh, AT devices for her communication and engagement. She can maybe use a proximity device which uh, does not even uh, require precise uh, pressing and activation. She can also use iTalk to communicator and she can use her fist to touch it. And so there are a variety of things and then she can use an adapted cuff to grasp the writing tool or the brush, as I said, uh, with, a, with a thick brush that you can just kind of press on the, on the object or on the device. Um, there are uh, these kind of special brushes, wide brushes, one inch brushes that are available that you can use as a kind of a tool for somebody with motor needs. And some of the adapted summary type of pictures are provided here so that she can uh, you can use a PowerPoint presentation, you can program it into a bookworm so that there is repeated opportunity for her to access the information. You can create a word wall and pair pictures or objects and then also connect it with a talking brick communicator. She, you can use a more simplified graphic organizer so that there is one event, there is a story theme and you may present all of these things not at the same time. You may present, let's say, characters on one day and maybe for a week and then theme for a week and then event uh, for a week, you know, or uh, so that she is not overwhelmed and it doesn't become too complex. And present materials in a variety of ways to reach, like using real concrete items, and for students who put things in their mouth, and if it, that should be a problem, you can put them inside mini Ziploc bags, as it is shown in this slide. And uh, you can certainly present information in multiple formats, presenting the story of the caterpillar using like a concept map. That's what is shown here, and it enables 
someone with significant communication and cognitive needs like some more to access the information much more easily. And as we come closer to the end of this uh, session, I do want to point out a, a number of resources. One is Downing's uh, book is um, a great book if you're looking at uh, uh, academic instruction for students with moderate to severe disabilities. And another one, this is uh, actually an article in Teaching Exceptional Children. It is using flexible participation in a technology-supported universal design uh, preschool. And as I mentioned, I have several books. One of them is Serving Students with Severe and Multiple Disabilities, published, published by LRP, and my most recent book that focuses on students with significant disabilities. And, uh, and it also presents UDL application in each of the 11 lesson frameworks, and I also have a book on autism. I also want to mention at this time, both IDEA, that is Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, clearly identifies UDL approach, and so does the new law that was passed in December 2015, Every Student Succeeds Act, also clearly says UDL should be part of that instructional framework and also actually it says it should be part of the assessment so that uh, we provide maximal access and engagement to students with significant needs. Uh, and some of the other resources or presented on this slide. One of the things, and the link to the, my recent book is also presented. One of the things that you will find very, very helpful is the UDL website, and it has a number of resources, including something called the Book Builder. Uh, as we come to a close, I will be happy to answer any chat questions that you may have. Uh, I do want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for joining this webinar. The next part of this webinar, which will focus on action and expression as it relates to universal design for learning, will be on March 1st. Um, and um, again, I want to thank AbleNet for hosting this webinar. Thank you very much, and I will now try to answer any chat questions that you have. Thank you. One of the questions is, um, mine varies depending on the class. I am teaching interactive with higher, less concrete students and hands-on with those very concrete students. I totally agree with you. Yes, you have to personalize it and make it student-specific. And all the time, being aware that when you use hands-on, it reaches all students, and in a way, it helps with that memory transfer so that it passes on to the long-term memory. And concrete materials, I, I agree, is much more appropriate for a student who has significant cognitive and communication needs. But hands-on activities will apply to a lot of students, and students love, for example, doing experiments. Students, for example, love novelty. And each, each time we begin, we can certainly begin with something kind of novel, even if it is not each time. When we are certainly introducing a new concept, it is a good idea to be begin with something novel or something that's kind of they can immediately connect with their own personal life that is personally relevant and meaningful to them. 